Hello everyone, my name is Keith. I'm the radio call WD4PTJ. I've always been interested in how ham radio operators got into amateur radio. And so I thought today that I'd tell you my story, my ham radio story. Uh, I hope it doesn't come across as being uh, too uh, egotistical or self-centered, you know, but uh, I'm not trying to say that mine is some kind of uh, credible story. It may be boring to some people, but I thought I'd, I would tell my ham radio story. And I hope that everyone that sees this, if you w or would, in the comment section, tell me your ham radio story. How you got involved in amateur radio. I think back and the first time I really became aware probably of amateur radio, ham radio. I can't tell exactly how old I was, but I remember an article in the uh, the local paper about two ham radio operators that had set up in the local park for field day and operated there. And I would guess I was, I don't know, maybe 10 years old, somewhere around there, roughly. And that kind of sparked an interest. And most of you that are more <laughs> my age may uh, relate to what I'm about to say. But now, nowadays, if uh, anybody's interested in something, uh, Google is your friend. You know, you get on the internet and do a search for whatever that topic is. Well, back in the 60s when I was a kid, uh, you know, internet wasn't around then. So, what I would do is, uh, my parents had brought me a set of World Book Encyclopedias. You know, local school teacher uh, during the summer is a uh, summer job when they weren't teaching would sell World Books and... So my parents got me a set of encyclopedias, so if there was anything that I was interested in, you know, it could be space travel, it could be aircraft, whatever, uh, I'd go get the world book and look it up. So after seeing this uh, this article about the two halves uh, setting up for field day, I, I got out the world book encyclopedia and, and looked up uh, amateur radio. And so got a little acquainted there, I guess, as to what it was. Well, sometime later on, I had an uncle that uh, had a, a shortwave radio. It was like a transistor, large transistor radio. It picked up AM, FM, uh, shortwave bands, aircraft uh, bands, uh, public service. And this radio was at my grandmother's house. This uncle was... Uh, he stayed at my grandmother's house some, too. He was a World War II vet, and uh, he'd never married, and he had some health problems. Uh, he wound up passing away at an early age, but he had left this radio at my grandmother's house, and I know I was, I was there one time with my parents, and, and I was uh, just fascinated by this radio, you know, and how I could, could hear shortwave stations, uh, you know, all over the world. This was at a time when... Shortwave was still, you know, uh, there were quite a few shortwave stations compared to what there are now. Well, my grandmother was kind of scared that I was going to mess up my uncle's radio. I remember her kind of, kind of, uh, you know, warning about not, not playing around with it. But my parents seen I was interested in this radio, so that's uh, I got one very similar to that for Christmas. And I don't really remember how old I was at the time I got this. I might have been... I don't know, 12 years old. Uh, but anyway, at that age, I was I was fascinated by being able to pick up the short wave stations. And it, as time went on, I got to be a teenager. I was more interested in listening to the FM rock stations on it. But uh, I still listen to the short wave station some. But that, that just kind of sparked an interest in short wave radio, long distance communication. And, you know, you, you could... You could uh, I don't remember really hearing any ham radios on there as far as voice was concerned. Uh, you could hear some uh, Morse code from time to time. But that, that uh, 
sort of sparked an interest there. And you move forward a little bit in time, and you get to the, the late 70s and the CB craze. And everybody had a CB radio at that time. And I was going to, uh, to college. I was going to school in Memphis and driving the hour and a half from where uh, my parents live down to, uh, to Memphis. Uh, I'd come back sometimes on the weekend. And my father ran a service station. And somehow or another, I guess it was a customer of the service station, came in with a CB radio and somehow or another, I guess, was doing some trading around with my father or whatever, and he got this radio. And so I got kind of interested in that, and whenever I was, uh, I, had, I had wrecked the vehicle I had, and that summer I was uh, driving his vehicle sometimes when he would let me in. Anyway, so he saw I was kind of interested in this radio, so he wound up eventually just letting me have it. And, like I say, all of my friends, or a lot of my friends at that time, had CB radios in their, their cars. So that was kind of a, a, an introduction to, to two-way radio. But even at that time, I knew what ham radio was, and I knew the difference between that and CB, and, and I knew that I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied with, uh, with what CB radio you know, had to offer. And so I, I, was, I was really looking... To get into ham radio, I remember going by a Radio Shack store in Memphis and getting a a study guide. But I had no idea where to uh, where to you know go about uh, taking an exam and getting a license at that time. I also remember going by when I was in college in Memphis, going by the the uh, when they still had the Mid South Fair at the fairgrounds in Memphis, and the ham radio club down there. Uh, had a set up there. They were, you know, demonstrating the ham radio. And I remember remember seeing that and, you know, was, you know, that sparked my interest more too. Well, I eventually uh, got out of college. Uh, I never did finish uh, getting a degree, but I got out of college and got married. And we were living uh, here not far from where I live now in, in a town. And I happened to pick up the, the local paper there. And a local ham radio club, there's a Humboldt Amateur Radio Club at that time. And they were offering a, a class to get your ham radio license. Now, this is back in 1978. And at that time, of course, the entry-level exam was still the novice exam. And, of course, you were going to have to learn code uh, also. So I went to the local library where they were offering this class and started taking, you know, the class there. And one of the gentlemen that was given this class was this gentleman here, Ed Holmes, the before IGW. And so went to this class, you know, it, it took a little while because we had to learn the code too. And it probably took longer to learn than the theory. So we were meeting about once a week for a while, and eventually took the, uh, the exam, and I passed it. And so then it was time, well, to get on the air, to, you know. So Ed Holmes had a, a uh, I was looking, you know, to buy a radio, and he knew that. So he had a, a Galaxy 3, and if you're not familiar with that, it, uh, it's an HF rig that, that has uh, 80, 40, and 20 meters. Didn't have 10, 15. Of course, at that time, the uh, 12, 17, 30, and all, they, they weren't uh, ham bands at that time. And it didn't have 160 either. So I got this radio, and I made a dipole for it, made an antenna, and got on the air. And, you know, was excited about that. And, of course, the only privileges a novice had then were Morse code. So I was making contacts on Morse code. And I was pretty much limited to 40 meters with the size lot that I had an antenna. I got on 80 a, a few times, but uh, pretty much the antenna I, I could have put up on the lot that we were living at uh, was for 40 meters. 
So I was uh, on the air there for uh, for a while and went to that had that club's uh, field day, and that was pretty neat because I was there and it was another uh, younger. He was actually younger than me. Uh, got that time that had been, gone through that class, and we were at field day, and a lot of the older hams weren't as interested in in getting on the air. It was, you know, old old thing to them, you know, working field day, and so they kind of let us uh, have the radio quite a bit, and not, uh, you know, being limited to to uh, Morse code most of the time. We were able because they were there. Uh, to oversee it, we were able to get on phone during the field day, and you know I had a, had a blast then. So, but what happened is that we were wound up, my, me and my, my family then, uh, you know, wound up with two sons, very young kids at that time, and we wound up moving to some different rental houses, and I had trouble with the, the radio eventually. Uh, had some trouble with it, and I never really lost interest, but after about a year, uh, I was no longer on the air, and I kept thinking that, uh, you know, I was going to get back on someday. Well, I kept the license renewed anytime it came up for renewal, uh, never did, had, had not upgraded, and as it wound up, you know, I, I became interested in some other activities, some other things, and raising a family. I didn't get back on the air for 20 years. So part of the story here is that if you haven't been active, don't think that you can't, uh, over a period of time, that you can't get back involved in, in ham radio. So about 1999, some 20 years later, uh, I sort of got the bug again. I think I might have been at a bookstore and saw a, saw a copy of either uh, QST or CQ magazine, and I sort of got, got the bug. Well, you know, it's time I got back on the air, you know. My kids were grown. I was divorced at that time, and I was like, I got I got time, and and uh, I'm just I'm going to get back into it. So I wound up getting a Kenwood TS520S. Of course, it was even an, an older rig then. You know, it was a rig from the 70s. And I got it, put up an antenna, a G5 RV, and got back on the air. And at first, I didn't have a microphone I didn't, uh, when I bought the uh, the 520. But uh, I had a key, so I got back on. I'm still a novice. I got back on the novice bands and started working. It was just kind of like old times. And, of course, but this time, I had a radio that also... Uh, worked on uh, 15 and 10, so I was on the novice bands on 15 and 10. And I'd never worked any DX, you know, when I first got on the air back in the 70s. And uh, I remember the first DX station I worked. I was getting up early every day to go into work. And I was get, had to be into work or was going into work at 5 o'clock at that time, uh, 5 in the morning. So I was up 4 o'clock in the morning. One morning I woke up just a little bit early, you know, before the alarm went off, and I had a little bit of time, and I'm like, I'm going to go turn the radio on 40 meters and just see what I can, what I might hear at this time in the morning, you know, 40 meters going to be, you know, at night time, and it's still dark then, is uh, is going to reach out further, so I got, uh, got turned the radio on, then was listening, and there was a station calling CQ, and I started copying down the call sign, and I don't remember the exact call without looking back in my log, but I'm like, started with a C, and I'm like, this is not, you know, not a U.S. ham. Anyway, it turned out it it, uh, it was ham radio operator in Cuba. So that was uh, the first DX I ever ever worked. Well, anyway, after a little while, I got, uh, got a microphone for the 520. And, of course, by this time, uh, things had changed from when I first was a novice. And novice, of course, had... Uh, phone privileges on, on uh, 10 meters. So I started working some phone on, t on 10 meters and started working some DX. And I got hooked on, on working DX. I, it was what always fascinated me about one of the things about ham radio anyway was, was talking to stations all over the world. You know, that, that's still the, uh, the thing that, that fascinates me. 
So I started uh, uh, started working some DX. And I was determined at that time, besides that, that I was going to do something before I upgraded. Because I had never, back when I first got on the air, I had never got to, to work all states, to get a, an all works worked all state certificate uh while I was a novice, I, I decided before I upgraded, I was going to work all states as a novice with a novice and a CW endorsement to it. So I set about doing that and got all the way to the last state I needed, which was Rhode Island, and managed to get in touch with a, a ham, radio op, ham radio operator in Rhode Island. Uh, I had found out his, his email address and uh, managed to, to work out a skid and get that last state I needed. So after that, I was like, well, it's time to upgrade. So I went and I took the technician test. And sometime later on, might have been, a, I think, another a whole year later on, I went and took the general and upgraded to general. So that sort of, uh, you know, got me got me started. That It opened up even more bands to, to work DX. And uh, I was able to check into the the uh, section net here, the Tennessee phone net on uh, on 80 meters, and did some contesting. I, I enjoy doing, I'm not a big, big serious contester, but I enjoy doing some contesting. And so eventually I decided I want a, wanted a, a better rig or, or, or a little bit newer rig. And I still wound up with something that was nowhere near brand new, but I got a, a TS-440. One reason I wanted something like that is so that when I was working any DX that uh, that was working split, I had something that would work split. The you know the old 520 wouldn't work split. So if I was trying to work anybody that was working split, I had to sit there and try to turn the VFO up so, uh, so far, and that that's pretty awkward if you've ever tried to do that. So I were upgraded to the uh, to the 440, and I guess I've always been kind of a Kenwood uh, person. But uh, anyway, so I, I had that radio for a while and eventually wound up with uh, radio. And I still have the 440. It's actually sitting over here on the floor. Eventually wound up with uh, this 850 uh, over here. I bought it at a local hound fest. And then the project that I got into uh, a few years ago is I decided I wanted to put up a tower. And I didn't, I didn't climb towers. I'm not, I'm not have a, a little bit of afraid of, of fear of height, you might say. So I knew I wasn't fixing to climb a tower. I didn't know anybody right then. I probably could have found somebody, but uh, at that time I didn't really know anybody to climb the tower. So I said I was going to make a, a, a tilt over tower project. And there's a, without going into a lot of description of that, there's a video here on my channel, uh, a, a couple of videos well actually about three about that project so i wound up uh completing that project it took a while for a tilt over tower it's 50 foot and with that i got an hf beam got a three element mosley beam and a, UH, a vhf uhf beams it's above that so that sort of uh you know got me where i could work a little more dx you know once i got a beam i i don't ever think you can't work uh, a lot of DX with a wire antenna. I, I, I finished DXCC, and by the time I got the tower, I had already worked over 150 countries just with a wire antenna. And there are people that work a lot more than that with a wire antenna. So it, it, it can be done. So anyway, I, uh, I finished that project, and, you know, that, that's, uh, that's what I have now. And... About a little over a year ago, after I retired, I bought myself a retirement present, and that's the uh, the Kenwood uh, five ninety uh, S over here, which is the newer rig I've got. So that's kind of the layout of the station here, you know. And uh, anyway, I guess to sum it up, I, I enjoy, I still enjoy chasing DX. I've worked uh, uh, about one hundred and ten, I mean, two hundred and ten countries now, and. Since I've retired, I get more time to uh, to chase that, and you know I I check into the uh, the uh, Tennessee phone net about every day, and a couple of the the local uh, VHF two meter nets that we have here, 
and I'm active in a, a couple of the uh, local radio clubs here. And you know, like I said, I, I enjoy working. Uh, I enjoy working special event stations too, especially things like museum museum ships on the air. And I still enjoy listening to uh, what few short wave stations there are. Sometimes, you know, uh, I enjoy uh, enjoy doing that from time to time. Uh, when I'm just sitting around the shack here and don't feel like uh, getting on the air myself, you know, I'll, I'll listen to uh, to uh, some shortwave stations, and uh, you can find some videos that I have here, you know, about that. So, I guess that kind of uh, sums up my journey through ham radio to this point. Uh, like I say, I was off the air for 20 years, and uh, so if you've been inactive. Don't think that you uh, can't get back in, involved uh, in ham radio uh, because you can always come back to it. So I really hope that everybody that sees this will, uh, in the comment section, tell me your ham radio story. How, what got you involved into amateur radio and how you went about you know, your amateur radio journey to where you are now. So I hope we'll see that in the comments. So anyway, till next time. 73, everyone.